Thank you, R.C. I was wondering, Mr. Hamilton, would you be willing to entertain a couple more questions from me? Be gentle, man. <laughs> yes. I have a question that is probably in the minds of many, and that is, Mr. Hamilton, do you think we should withdraw all our military forces from Iraq? In responding to the question, Mr. Hamilton, do you think we should withdraw all our military forces from Iraq? In responding to this question, some have resorted to remarks that rely on alarming the passions of the people, rather than on trying to convince them by using reasoned arguments. Statements are made without merit to make the public fearful about the presence of our military establishments in far-flung locales. Though we are separated by great distances and oceans from that region of the world, various considerations warn us against an access of confidence or security. Improvements in the art of navigation and the facility of communication have rendered distant nations, in a great measure now, our neighbors. Further, a great concert of views between nations now regarded as each other's enemies may occur and we should ever be vigilant to address the consequences of such compacts. There is a constant necessity of keeping small military dispatchments in frontier outposts. No person can doubt that these will continue to be indispensable if only to protect against the ravages and depredations of terrorists. State militias should not be used to populate these outposts. Such service, which is most disagreeable in times of peace, would weigh too heavily on their families and occupations. Having a regular army maintain those outposts would be less injurious to the public. If the forces of terrorism try to gain footholds within the border of our nation, then we should find it expedient to maintain our frontier outposts in some ratio to the threat posed by those forces in our own country. The outposts should not be abandoned because what would prevent their seizure and use by our enemies to strengthen their power and resolve? To act in that way would be to desert all the usual maxims of prudence and policy. Thank you, sir. As a follow-up to that question, uh, Mr. Hamilton, what do you think of the financial cost of the war? The financial cost of the war in Iraq. Bob. Robert. Mr. Bradley. What are the chief sources of expense in every national government? What has occasioned that enormous accumulation of debts with which we and many other nations are oppressed? The answer is wars and rebellions. The support of those institutions which are necessary to guard the body politic against those two most mortal diseases of our society. The expenses arising from those institutions which are relative to the mere domestic police of a state to the support of its legislative, executive, and judicial departments with their different appendages and to the internal encouragement of agriculture and manufacturers are insignificant in comparison with those which relate to the national defense. As revenue is the essential engine by which the means of answering the national exigencies must be procured, the power of procuring that article is in its full extent must necessarily be comprehended in that of providing for those exigencies. The federal government must, of necessity, be invested with an unqualified power of taxation to provide the revenue for the debt for our war. Money is with propriety considered as the vital principle of the body politic, as that which sustains its life and motion, and enables it to perform its most essential functions. A complete power, therefore, to procure a regular and adequate supply of it may be regarded as an indispensable ingredient to the survival of the national government. In framing a government for posterity as well as ourselves, we ought to design revenue provisions that are not designed to address temporary conditions, but base them on permanent causes of expense. Thank you, sir.
Now, one final question in this area, going a little bit broader than the war in Iraq, do you think that the constitutional provisions that deal with the war time powers of the government should be strictly interpreted and not viewed expansively? You're a smart whip, aren't you? <laughs> The authorities essential to the care of the common defense are these, ladies and gentlemen, to raise armies to build and equip fleets, to prescribe rules for the government of both, to direct their operations, to provide for their support. These powers ought to exist without limitation because it is impossible to foresee or define the extent and variety of national exigencies or the correspondent extent and variety of the means which may be necessary to satisfy them. The circumstances that endanger the safety of nations are infinite, and for this reason no constitutional shackles can be wisely be imposed on the power to which the care of it is committed. This power ought to be coextensive with all the possible combinations of such circumstances. This is one of those truths which to a correct and unprejudiced mind carries its own evidence along with it, and many be obscured, but cannot be made plainer by argument or reasoning. It rests upon axioms as simple as they are universal. The means ought to be proportioned to the end, to the persons from whose agency the attainment of any end is expected, ought to possess the means by which it is to be attained. If the federal government is trusted with the care of the common defense, then that government ought to be clothed with all the powers requisite to the complete execution of its trust. It cannot be fairly and rationally disputed that as a necessary consequence, there can be no limitation of that authority of the government to provide for the defense and protection of the community in any manner essential to its efficiency. That is, any manner essential to the formation, direction, and support of the military. Thank you.